about the ROVs. We still have uh, a couple of appendixes we need to go through uh, on part three. But before we do those, we're just going to close off part three itself, and then we're going to do appendix 5C, which is regards with regards to the calculations that you're going to do in the submission, just so that we've gone through it early enough so that you get some time to work on it. So it's not very complicated or anything, but we're just going to go through it so that you've, uh, you've done the theory at least. So um, last week we uh, finished off talking a bit about uh, how how uh, basically the ROV industry should develop itself. And uh, my own reflection is that it should go fully electrical as we go along. So move away from the hydraulic stuff and go fully electrical. And one of the reasons for that is, for an example, that um, as I mentioned uh, last time, is that you can uh, get it more compact. So you can get a smaller vehicle with a lighter weight than what you get with, uh, with the hydraulics systems. Because the hydraulic systems are usually large, they take a lot of room, and they also weigh quite a lot. So if you can run it all uh, electrical, that's, uh, that's a bit better uh, with regards to, to that. Um, also, uh, using, let's see, we have this uh, uh, fully electric ROV from, uh, from Schilling Robotics. Uh, and this is a sort of lightweight work ROV. So it's, uh, it can do some work, basically. Uh, usually when you see a fully electric ROV, it's, it's just a regular observation ROV. So it's, it just has electric propulsion on its thrusters to move it around, and it has electricity for lights and camera, just so that it can look around. But, but this one actually has manipulators that it can use. So I think in this image, the manipulators are sort of hidden on the, uh, on the other side, so we can't really see them. But, uh, but it, it can do some work, uh, but mostly lightweight tasks then. So it's a, it's a step in the right direction of developing larger and uh, more efficient uh, work RVs, fully electric. So one of the things that we can see here uh, are these thruster rings. And they look a bit different from what uh, regular thrusters uh, look like, because regular thrusters, they have this sort of uh, cupola in the middle. And then the propellers are coming out of the cupola and then they are rotating around the, the center axis. But these ones, if we look at the, the close-up view here, these ones are actually rotating along the outer ring, and then there is nothing in the center of them. This is because these are fully electric. So what they're doing instead is they're using electricity to move the entire outer ring, to rotate the entire outer ring, instead of having to use a, uh, a hydraulic motor in the middle here to make everything rotate. Uh, and this means that you can basically uh, compact the thruster quite a lot. You can get it quite a lot much uh, smaller uh, uh, and still have the same flow through it. Uh, and also uh, considering um, the, the uh, volume difference uh, with a, a hydraulic motor compared to having this just electrical ring here. There's a very few components on this one uh, to move. So it's uh, just the volume of it is, uh, is a lot uh, a lot better also, so you, you take, take up a lot less volume. Which means that you can compact your entire ROV quite a lot more. And uh, if you increase the frequency of the, uh, the electrical current you send through an electrical thruster like this one, uh, you can compact it even more, because with a higher frequency you get more effect out of it, so, so that uh, you can make it even smaller. Uh, and you can uh, reduce your uh, transformer uh, the one that's transforming the electricity coming from, from the supply vessel down into the ROV. You can reduce the size of the transformer also because it doesn't need to reduce uh, uh, the, uh, the electrical current that's coming, coming from the vessel. It doesn't need to, to get it down to such a small level when it can run at a higher frequency. So <coughs> you've probably seen like transformer uh, stations around uh, everywhere. So these small electrical houses that are uh, receiving uh, quite high voltage power from, uh, from the main lines. And then they are, uh, they are transforming it down to the 240 volts that we have in our wall sockets and distributing it to the, the local houses. So basically that's the same that's happening in the, uh, in the transformer inside the, uh, the ROV. So it's getting a high voltage uh, current that's coming from, uh, from the supply vessel. And then it's transforming it down to the correct uh, levels for the components inside the inside the ROV. 
And uh, by doing this, you can all even uh, reduce the thickness of the cables that you need, because you don't need that thick cables to have efficient uh, energy transfer. So, uh, so you, you get a lot of uh, positives from, from developing uh, the electrical RVs. Then we have uh, the last type of ROV that we're going to look at, which are autonomous underwater vessels. So we just looked briefly, uh, talked briefly about it, uh, like the ones, uh, the Norwegian ones that they uh, used to look for the, this uh, Malaysia Airlines uh, plane that just disappeared completely. Uh, and I think that's actually, that's actually the one that's uh, being pulled out here in the compendium. So they, they need to use, they need to bring all of their energy with them. And usually it's done with lithium batteries, so, so basically the same that's in a, a, an electric car, and the same that's in your smartphones and, and your iPads or, or whatever it is that you have. So usual lithium batteries. There are other ways of doing it also, different types of accumulators. They're also just called accumulators. They're not necessarily hydraulic accumulators uh, in that matter, but they are accumulators because they accumulate energy and then they can release it. Uh, in a, so, so basically a battery is also an electrical accumulator in the same way as, uh, as a, a hydraulic accumulator stores and can release hydraulic energy. The battery stores and can release uh, electrical energy. So there are different kinds of accumulators that they can use. <coughs> it's also been looked into using seawater batteries. So, so basically, uh, I'm not quite sure about the physics uh, in this one, but in a regular, if you look at a regular car battery, which is uh, lead plates, and uh, you have um, isotopic water that you put into it, and then you have a reaction happening over uh, b between the lead plates uh, and across the uh, the uh, uh, water. So I think that's what they're thinking about with the seawater batteries. It's to be able to use just seawater uh, in this in this regard because then they can just have the plates and they can utilize the water around the, the, the vehicle. But I haven't heard much about this uh, in later years, so I think it sort of petered out and they didn't get it to work properly, uh, but it might be happening. A Stirling engine, that's a really efficient engine that's run on, uh, on uh, steam mostly. Uh, they're, they're very cool, um, so I if you want to just look at something something uh, really amazing, just go to YouTube and search for, for Stirling engines and, and look at those. Basically, you can have Stirling engines where you have a cup of hot water and you can place the Stirling engine on top of the uh, cup of hot water and it's going to start to run. So it only needs the heat fro from, the, uh, from the cup of hot water and that's all it needs to, to start running. So, so they're, they're, really, uh, they're really cool and efficient and I know the, the Swedish Navy actually use Stirling engines in their uh, submarines so, so that they have Stirling engines running and they're, they're really silent. So, so you can't, that was the, the incentive of using them in a submarine because then you could sort of hide from, uh, from your enemies because you wouldn't make much noise in the water if they couldn't hear you. So um, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very cool engine principle to, uh, to look at. And all, of course, uh, you could run a closed diesel operation, which is basically the same as, uh, as the uh, diesel run submarines do only on a larger scale, of course. This would be on a smaller scale if it's an autonomous vessel. But still, those uh, have to, you need air to run, run a diesel combustion engine, which means that every now and then you get exhaust also, of course. So, so you, have to, you have to save up air that you can use for your combustion engine, and then you have to store your exhaust. And then every now and then you can come up to, come up to the surface and you can exchange your exhaust for air, and then you can go down again. So, so it's, a, it's a much more, much more intricate system of using, so, so you're reliant on the autonomous vehicle actually making it to the surface every now and then to, to, uh, to refresh the air supply and everything like that. Um, I think it's possible to release the exhaust just directly into the water, uh, but I can't really remember exactly how those, uh, those uh, closed diesel operations work, but uh, it's, um, it's sort of, yeah, it, it does also require quite a lot of space, so it's going to be a huge vessel that you're running. And the, the larger it is, then the more engine power you need, and then the larger the engine needs to be, so it's sort of a, a uh, and, uh, not so good circle there going around. Fuel cells has also been looked into, and those are basically uh, uh, using uh, hydrogen uh, gas, uh, uh, and you're sending it through a, uh, basically you have hydrogen gas and then air or oxygen gas, and you're sending 
the hydrogen atoms through a membrane, and when they pass through the membrane, they generate electricity. Uh, so that's where you get the electricity from. And the end product is that hydrogen and oxygen fuse together, and you get H2O, which is just regular water. So, so you, uh, they're really highly efficient wi with regards to, uh, to, uh, to uh, creating energy, and also there are basically they don't have any waste. Uh, they just create clean water uh, when they're finished. Uh, but still, br bringing the, the oxygen and bringing the, the hydrogen gas down uh, can be uh, a bit more tricky. So you have to have it under pressure and everything uh, inside, the, inside the, the autonomous vehicle. So it's, it's a li little bit uh, sketchy, uh, that one also. It's a bit easier using fuel cell on a car, for an example, because then you can just pop off to a, to, a, to a gas station and you can fill hydrogen gas on it and you can you just use the air that's surrounding you uh, to make it uh, make it react so, so it's not really a, a a huge problem of doing it but then when you're on the water it's a bit different so uh, and then the last one is of course trying to utilize nuclear power for those like the the uh, rovers uh, that NASA use up on Mars and stuff like that they're nuclearly powered some of them uh, not all of them. Uh, some of them are just using solar energy, so that when once when it turns night up at Mars, it just shuts down and just waits until daytime before it starts up again. But some of them actually use nuclear power, so so it's a it's a small reactor, uh, nuclear reactor that they bring along. But these are still not small enough that it's going to be easy to put it into uh, an autonomous underwater vessel, and also you don't really. The, the, there's a lot of safety aspects there. What if the what, what if the vessel uh, crashes or something and uh, breaks open this uh, uh, this uh, nuclear power cell? Uh, then you're suddenly going to have radiation leaking into the the ocean water, and uh, it's, it's it's bad enough having uh, uh, having uh, Japan being on a on, on a, an earthquake zone uh, with their the the huge tragedies that we got there with the tsunami last time uh, and a lot of a lot of radiation leaking into the sea uh, that way. So, so you don't really want to be sending stuff like that around until you're absolutely sure it's safe and they're not quite there yet. So, so that's a long-term development as it's uh, put in here. But I could imagine that as if NASA uh, develops even safer ways of doing it, because of course if you're in space it's not and it's just a robot, it's not really that important if, it's, if there's a lot of radiation coming from it. There's a lot of radiation in space anyway. So it doesn't really matter if, if you have it. You don't really need any shielding on, the, on your uh, nuclear power plant when you're sending it away from Earth. But, uh, but uh, using it here on Earth, you're going to need, need quite a lot of uh, shielding and be quite sure that nothing's going to happen with it. <coughs> uh, so this is the one uh, that's mentioned in the, in the um, uh, compendium here. So it's the Hugen. Uh, autonomous underwater uh, vessel, uh, and it's uh, created by Kongsberg, which is uh, uh, a, a, a very old company in, uh, in Norway. So they've been been uh, uh, I think they started off with uh, mining or something, and then they went off to to creating uh, uh, creating uh, weaponry, and then they've just branched off into all kinds of uh, uh, areas. So, so now they're they're uh, quite heavy in the in the military aspect, and they're also uh, in in the oil and gas industry. They they have uh, have quite a lot of uh, pull there. So uh, it's a huge company with uh, I think they're well over a hundred years old. So so they have have quite quite an ancestry there, and they've uh, they've developed this one, and I think it was this one that that's uh, been down uh, outside of uh, in the in the Indian Ocean looking for that Malaysia Airlines uh, plane. Uh, it could have been the next one, uh, which is the uh, sort of second generation of this one, which is the Munin one. I think this is, uh, yeah, this is just a clip from, from that one, so we'll just look at that one first. <coughs> there we go, so there's a bit of sound there.
So you can see like they've <coughs> they've really streamlined the shape of it, so, so it looks more like a fish. And that's basically just to 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 try to avoid too much power loss due to the shape of the of the uh, vessel. So it's a bit different from uh, from how they uh, use regular ROVs, where they have to lower them down with cranes and everything. Here they just let it slide into the water and then it. Uh, off on its own. So it's got these sort of uh, antennas uh, up top so that when it uh, when it gets to a critical level in, in energy it's just going to stop and it's going to, to um, ha it has, uh, I believe it has some compressed air uh, inside it that it's going to release into some balloons uh, expanding the balloons and then it's going to become uh, very positively buoyant so it's just going to float up to the surface basically. And every now and then it can surface and transmit signals to to the ship that's following it. <laughs> yeah, there was this one. These are different kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, measurement instruments that they have. And then I can track it in uh, on the maps just to see exactly where the the ROV itself is. And this is sort of a, a critical moment when they're going to bring it back up again. Because they try to, to get a hold of it and then they need to bring it up back up the slide where they released it. And that's, uh, you can't really have much waves going around if you're, if you're going to ma manage to, to do this without damaging uh, the AUV. So it's not really a, uh, it's not really a very good way of doing it, but uh, I think that's the, the the best they could uh, come up with uh, there and then. This is the end of the clip. Yeah. And there's the, the second generation, which is the moon in one. <coughs> you can see this one looks a bit more like a torpedo, basically.
they're uh, they're working on different ways of uh, managing to recharge these without actually having to pull them aboard a ship. So no, no, there, there, are, there are some designs where it can surface and it can sort of uh, release some uh, solar panels to recharge with sunlight. Uh, and I know some of them are looking also at u using wind, because whenever you're out at sea, there's usually wind uh, in some way. So basically have a way of uh, extending uh, some sort of uh, uh, wind turbine up from, from it so that you can, can start recharging it a bit. So did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, usually they have a predefined path, but, but what they're working on is trying to get, um, uh, of course, they're trying to work on, on making them a bit more uh, self-intelligent so that they can make, uh, make decisions themselves so that if they're following a predetermined path and uh, suddenly at the ends of, uh, uh, of, of the reach of their sonar, for an example, they pick up something that looks uh, man-made, basically, a, a shipwreck or, or something, uh, then they might veer off the path to, to go and look at this one and just uh, map it completely before it continues back back to its path and, and stuff like that. So, so they're trying to, to put as much, basically uh, as much autonomy into it as possible so that they, they set the path, look in this area, and, and then it's going to, to sort of figure it out itself, how it's going to do it. So, so basically, uh, almost like uh, like what you would do with uh, with these, uh, these Roombas, these, these robot uh, vacuum cleaners, because that's what they also do, uh, and the robot lawnmowers and everything, b because they just create the map themselves of, of the area that they're, they're going to pass over, uh, and, and they make sure that they've filled in everything using different algorithms and stuff like that. So, so they're looking at implementing stuff. That, uh, actually, I'm not quite sure if they've already done it on, on this one, the second generation one, but, but the first generation one was uh, pretty much predetermined, so, so they had to, they had to uh, program it beforehand release it, it would go most of the route, and uh, maybe it would surface every now and then, and they, then they could have uh, direct uh, contact with it again, wireless contact, and, and uh, just give it uh, new instructions and, and stuff like that. So, But they're also working on ways of uh, being able to do wireless transfer more efficiently in water, because as it is now, it's only the, the, the sound waves that work, but, but they are working on, uh, on ways of utilizing the entire scope of sound waves uh, so that they can get basically get more efficient uh, transfer of uh, of communication basically just if you look at at how how efficient uh, uh, the mobile uh, network has become uh, where you have 4g and, and you're uh, closing on 5g that's being done by, by expanding it so, so they're using different ranges in, in the spectrum uh, so that they can can get more information across <coughs> and like uh, cl closing down other parts uh, of, of the bandwidth, so, such as the uh, FM radio network that's going to be closed down soon, and basically because they are going to free it up so that they can use it for the mobile networks instead. So that's why they've uh, changed this DAB uh, network instead. So it's um <coughs> they're all they are doing the same uh, with uh, wireless transfer uh, underwater. So they're looking at the, the same stuff there. And, and uh, of course, the dream with these is that they are going to be able to to have uh, a long-lasting power supply, ideally the, the nuclear one that would basically last years, so, so that they uh, didn't have to didn't have to be recharged for many years once you deploy them. Um, but unless you can get the, the nuclear one, then have some way of them to surface and then recharge themselves, uh, having uh, that as a possibility. Uh, and basically just releasing them into the ocean and having them do stuff. And every time when they surface, then you can transfer large uh, amounts of data and then you can, uh, can send new instructions uh, if you have more to them. For an example, with the, this uh, Langeled uh, pipeline, which is immensely long, 1,100 kilometers, if you could have a couple of these just patrolling along the pipelines in the North Sea, so they would uh, every now and then surface, send their data, what, whatever they uh, found when they were uh, surveying the uh, or inspecting the pipelines. And then they can get new instructions. Now you need to go to that pipeline and you need to check that one. And then they would go over there. So they would just recharge and then go over there. So, so it's, uh, that's sort of the dream because then it's, it's pretty expensive having a surface vessel following uh, an ROV all the time. Uh, even when you're doing these uh, pipeline inspections and everything, it's, it's really expensive. So that's why... <coughs> Uh, that's why the, the uh, pipeline survey 
ROVs usually are more more streamlined, like like these are, so, so they look more flat uh, and can move easy more easily through the water because they want the speed up so, so that they can move faster and use less time uh, in their operations. But of course, if you could release just a, a fleet of these, 10, 15 of them just into the sea and just every now and then uh, get information from them and send new instructions to them, go, go there and uh, look at that. Uh, uh, then you could have maybe one or two vessels that were out there and uh, if one of them sent out a distress signal or oh, something's wrong, I can't recharge or something, then they would just go to the location and pick it up and fix it. S so suddenly you have quite a lot less uh, expenses with everything. So maybe it's, it's expensive to, to create uh, and buy uh, one of these AUVs because there's a lot of high-tech stuff in it, but, but still uh, in the long run you could save quite a lot of money if you, if you got this running. <coughs> so I think that was the uh, last slide on this one. Yeah. So then we'll start looking at at um, some calculations, because th these calculations th they're placed under Part Five for surface vessels, uh, be be because like in the submission we're using them when we are lowering down equipment but the same goes the same calculations as you will uh, learn to do here the same goes when you're lowering down an rov itself so it might as well be be in the uh, rov section that these uh, these uh, calculations were placed so it's just a matter of where to put them so we'll do them now and start looking at them and uh, the first thing we'll look at is the difference between mass weight and buoyancy. So I'll let you all get get a chance at uh, finding the the correct appendix there. So it's the five C one. Go back here. So Yeah, I think most of you are in the correct location now. <coughs> so as I said, we're, we're going to look at the difference between mass, weight, and buoyancy. And mass, when we, uh, when we look back at uh, the, the original physics course that you did, we know that mass basically is the amount of material in an object. And, and it's, uh, it's going to give us the weight of the object, it's an integral part of the weight, but mass itself cannot be, be measured in that way. <coughs> because what it is, is uh, the resistance against acceleration. That's, uh, that's basically what the mass tells us. So how difficult is it going to be to accelerate this, uh, this object? So a heavy object is going to be more, diffi uh, more difficult to accelerate than, than a light object. And that's because the heavy object has more mass than the other one. And the mass will stay constant no matter where you are. If you're uh, here or at the bottom of the sea or uh, at the moon, for that matter, uh, the mass will always be the same. But weight is, of course, going to change uh, no matter where you are. And we usually, the, the standard, uh, standard uh, unit is kilograms. But usually when we're talking about about uh, uh, stuff offshore, we end up with tons because we are usually more than one ton when we're looking at things. So, so uh, we w very seldomly get to lower than uh, bel below one ton uh, mark there. So then, then it's something really small that you're doing. And, and then the ROV can lift it itself. You don't need a, a separate lifting vessel to, to, to lift it for it. <coughs> and then we have weight which is an expression of the force directed towards the center of the Earth. Which means that, uh, 
world, not, not necessarily just the center of the Earth, but towards the center of gravitation. So if you were up on the moon, it would be the center of the moon instead, or on Mars, it would be the center of Mars. And it's going to be different. Whether we are here on, uh, on uh, the Earth, on the moon, it's one sixth, I think it is, or something like that. And on Mars, I think it's one third um, of what we have here. One third or two thirds, I can't quite remember which it is. But, but usually, if we're just staying still, uh, like here, it's just gravity that's working on us. And then we get the, the hole with mass times gravity gives us the weight that we need. And we always just use 9.81 uh, for gravity. Uh, even though it does change slightly, depending on where you are uh, on the face of the Earth, there are different values to get from them, but they're always somewhere around 9.1. Uh, and 9.8 at least. So 9.81 is the one that we usually just say that that's the the universal one that that counts for around the entire world. So uh, it has a little bit to do with uh, with uh, just the the uh, geology of the Earth and and what kinds of rocks are below you and everything like that. So so it's it's a bit different uh, with regards to that because. <coughs> Um, if, if you remember uh, gravity theory from Newton, uh, wha what gravity actually is, it's just a, an object with mass is going to attract another object with mass. And then we have uh, an equation telling us how much they're going to be attracted to each other. But that also means that although we can only feel the gravity from Earth pulling on us, we are actually pulling on Earth also. But by a tiny, tiny amount, so you can't, it's, you can't really measure it or anything. But if you're looking at the huge mountain, that has gravity also. So the mountain itself has gravity, and it's also going to pull on you. So, so that's why it uh, differs a little bit wherever you are on Earth uh, uh, with regards to, to how exactly what, uh, what the force is, the, the acceleration is. So <coughs> we're just going to stay with this one, and... Um, maybe, I'm not quite sure how, uh, how a tourbillon does it in uh, mechanical design, but often when you are calculating uh, the loads that you're going to get, you would actually uh, round it off to 10 meters per second second. Uh, because <coughs> that will give you, uh, give you a larger weight than what you actually have. Uh, so you're basically just putting in a small safety factor by, by just rounding it up and you're making your calculations a lot easier so, so it's a uh, but uh, you can round it up but you can't round it down uh, when you're doing it so rounding it up to 10 uh, is uh, is allowed and uh, no one's going to get any any uh, marks uh, negative marks in their submissions for, for rounding it up to 10 that's it's fully allowed it's it's a way of putting in some safety factors basically so, but 9.81 is the is the exact one that we use. And then we have buoyancy, and buoyancy that that's the uh, that's the one where Archimedes was uh, in his bath. He was uh, he was tasked with figuring out the the uh, I think it was the mass or the weight. It was the weight of uh, of uh, the king's crown or something like that. Uh, and he, he needed to figure out exactly what the weight was, or something like that. And uh, what he did was, uh, he took a bath, uh, the legend says at least, he took a bath, and then he had filled up his tub all the way up to the edge, and then he lowered himself in, and a lot of water splashed over on the, on the sides. And then he suddenly realized that the f uh, whatever he had lowered into the water, the volume of that, would be equal to the volume of water that was outside uh, uh, this um, uh, this uh, bathtub. Uh, yeah, now uh, now I remember. It was uh, he was uh, supposed to determine if uh, if the crown was solid gold or if it was fake in on the inside uh, and just had a gold plating on the outside. And one way of figuring out that is, of course, to look at uh, look at the uh, uh, the volume and everything. Uh, just know as much as you can about it. That, that's a good way of figuring it out. <coughs> and that's when he discovered that when you submerge an object in fluid, 
it has this buoyant force which will push it upwards and that buoyant force is equal uh, to the volume of the displaced fu fluid and then the density of that fluid. So <coughs> if you are putting something into water, you are displacing parts of, uh, parts of the water, just like if you, um, if you try it in your kitchen sink when you're doing your dishes, take a bowl and put it with, the, uh, with a bowl end down and you push it down, you can feel it being pushed up towards you again. Uh, and that's the buoyant force that's pushing up because you're displacing quite a lot of water and that water really wants to be where it's supposed to be so it's trying to push, uh, push the bowl out of, uh, out of the sink again. So <coughs> uh, that's something that's going to affect anything we do offshore because everything we do offshore we're going to lower it into water so, so that uh, we're going to get buoyancy on, on everything. And one way of gaining uh, gaining buoyancy is of course to increasing the volume without increasing the mass too much. That's what they do on ROVs, so they have these yellow elements uh, that you usually see. They are usually yellow, but sometimes they are other colors. And those are uh, usually foam type plates, uh, which has quite a lot of volume, but not much weight, so that they're, uh, they're easy to lift, uh, but they're going to they're going to displace quite a lot of water, so they're going to feel a lot of uh, buoyancy force uh, pushing them upwards. And if you uh, do the uh, calculations correctly with regards to the mass of all of the, the uh, heavy components on, on the ROV, and then you put on the buoyancy, and you buoyancy elements, and then you calculate this correctly, then you're going to basically going to be able to, uh, to make it more or less neutral in water, so that it's going to just, if you push it down 100 meters into the water, it's just going to stay there. It's not going to float upwards, it's not going to sink down, it's just going to stay there. Then it's just ocean currents that's going to move it up or down. So that's uh, one way of uh, uh, using this. But also we, we need to think about it with regards to, uh, to the, uh, the lifting wires when we're doing lifting operations, because when we're lifting a huge, say a blow-up preventer of 250 tons, lifting this one off of the uh, deck of the ship is going to weigh 250 tons and, and it's going to pull on, on the lifting wire with 250 tons. But then when you put it into the water, it's going to weigh a bit less because then you have buoyancy acting on it. And buoyancy is acting in the opposite direction of, of, uh, of the gravity so that you get, you get a cancelling effect there. And depending on the, the, uh, the volume and the buoyant force, you can easily end up with, if you, if you lower it too fast or if you have too much waves, you will get uh, your object into the water. And there's lifting wire. But then if you have quite a lot of waves here and you suddenly have waves that cover the entire, uh, entire almost the entire object at least, then the buoyant force that you're getting here might be enough to actually lift the object, which means that you're going to get slack on your wire. And then once the wave passes, the object is just going to drop down. And if it's a blow-up preventer of 250 tons, you really don't want that jerking on, on, uh, on your line. That's going to snap it completely. Either that or break your crane uh, somehow. So <coughs> it's really important to, to keep in mind the, the, f and the fact that uh, weight and mass isn't the same. That being said, once you get, once you get to the, uh, the bottom and you have, you have a surf, uh, protective structure, for example, here, you are, have an ROV that's moving around. If it's a work ROV, it can easily have a couple of tons uh, of mass in itself. And even though it's neutral I in water, so, so it has enough buoyant elements to, to cancel out the effect of gravity so that it's just floating there. If it moves at a, at a maximum speed and crashes into the protective structure, then you still, when you're calculating the collision force of what this is going to give, what kind of energy you're going to get, if you remember that from your physics, when you're looking at, uh, at uh, energy and collisions, you still have a couple of tons of mass here. So even though the weight is practically zero, you still ha have all of the mass that's hitting uh, this object. And that's going to, to cause a lot of damage. So that, uh, that's uh, something the, 
and the uh, ROV pilots have to have to take really uh, well into consideration the fact that if they if they accidentally hit something when they're moving around, they can actually damage it quite a lot, even though you wouldn't actually believe it when you look at how easily the ROV is moving around in the water. And it's just floating there. But if it hits something, it's uh, going to really damage it. It's basically the same as, uh, as uh, releasing the handbrake on one of the cars out here and just having it roll into a wall. It's going to really damage it. So, so it's, uh, well, it's mostly going to damage the car if it hits a wall, but, <laughs> but, but still, you're going to get a lot of damage. And that is also a problem because even though you didn't damage the protective structure, you, you'll probably smash the manipulators. If, if you hit it head on, uh, you might have uh, smashed your cameras and you can't see anything. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's not a good thing uh, to have collisions on the water either. So just to recap a bit, the mass of the object remains constant and the weight of the object is the results of gravity and buoyance. And even though we, we uh, usually just calculate weight uh, with mass and gravity uh, up here on the Earth, we, we actually should bring in buoyancy here also because we are moving around in a fluid. So the air around us is a fluid. But the density of air is so small compared to the density of water. So that th this part here would just it would be completely neg negligible if we actually calculated it with, with the uh, density of air. So, so that uh, this is actually the, the correct one always when, when you're calculating weight. So if you, if you, for example, went to another planet where you had a really dense atmosphere, if an astronaut was moving around there, it would be like moving around in water and you would have, uh, have buoyancy forces working on him as well as, as the weight. We'll do uh, a break and then we'll look at hydrodynamic mass.
Right. Um, so I just mentioned uh, to, to some of you, I'll, I'll be doing, uh, doing the, the, the rest of the people who I didn't get to mark down for attendance uh, in the first uh, hour. I'll do it when we get to the next room. So I'll just uh, call out your names and see, see who's uh, here then. <coughs> so we have uh, hydrodynamic mass that we're going to talk about. And this is, uh, well, uh, when we're calling it hydrodynamic mass, it's of course in, in, in ocean that we're talking about. It's, it's something that's, uh, that's wet, so it's a liquid that we're talking about. But we actually do get this effect in air also. But with regards to air having such a low density, you, you, you can't feel it at all. But actually what's happening is that if you're, <coughs> if you're swimming in a pool, What's going to happen when you're swimming is that in front of your chest, you're going to be pushing, uh, basically if you're doing uh, breaststrokes. So you're going to be pushing sort of a, a pillow of water in front of you. That's not going to be exchanged with, it's not going to be water flowing in and out of there. That's just going to be the same water that's trapped in front of you there. Because you are moving through the water and water that's uh, in front of you, it will hit this pillow and it will move around you. Which means that you are not only moving your own body mass, you are also moving the mass of this pillow of water that's in front of you. The same happens in air. When we are moving, we are moving a pillow of air in front of us. But since air is so, um, so light, we, we don't notice it at all. And it's a part of everyday life, so, so it's not something that we, uh, we see. But you can see it if you're running, uh, running wind tunnels on, uh, uh, on uh, fast cars. Or, uh, if, you, if you run a wind tunnel on a racing car, you will see that there is basically no, uh, no air uh, pillow in front of it. But if you run it on a truck, so a semi-truck, which is basically flat uh, in the front, then you're actually going to see that the air is sort of bunching up in front of it uh, in, into a pillow. So, so it does happen there also. Uh, with regards to, to uh, wind tunnels and looking at uh, the effects of air and so, uh, stuff like that, we're going to look at that a bit later on when we're talking about drag instead of mass. So be because uh, drag in water is basically the same as this drag in air. Uh, so, so the drag force is something that, uh, that you have to take into account because you have, to, you have to counteract it. So it's a force in the opposite direction of wha the way you're moving so, so that you, it's going to have a negative effect on your acceleration. <coughs> so that's something they look at when they design cars and uh, it's uh, one of the main uh, main things they look at when they're designing airplane wings because then they use it uh, to uh, they use the Bernoulli principle in order to gain gain lift properly um, but it is due to drag that they are are, are getting it also um, and we're going to look at it in water be because with the higher density of water drag is really uh, a problem sometimes um, and that's what you can see in in many ships also is that the, the main the main reason why their hulls are shaped as they are, are shaped is basically to, to uh, try to minimize drag as much as possible uh, for it. And that's why you have these, if you have really fast ships, you have these hydrofoil ships. I'm not sure if you've seen those. But the basic principle is that you have, uh, you have the vessel when it's uh, moving at a very slow pace. It's, uh, it's moving like a regular boat, basically. But underneath it, it has this almost like an uh, airplane wing. So that's the hydrofoil. And when it speeds up, this one is going to lift the entire hull up from, uh, from the uh, water. So that it's only the, the uh, basically this part that's going to stay, stay down in the water. And then you have the, the engines and everything. So it's going to lift up the hull and that way reduce drag. Because then it's only this sleek... Uh, very dynamic wing that's moving th through the water. So, so it has uh, very little drag on it. While, while uh, the hull itself, when it's moving slowly, has, uh, uh, has drag, uh, much more drag. So uh, with hydrodynamic mass, you do have that on vessels also, because you will have these, this pillow of water in, in front of the vessel and, and everything like that. So, so that's also one of the reasons why they try to make them as sleek as possible is basically to, to avoid having a large, uh, a large section where the water can just pile up and create a pillow in front of. But even though you have, you have a, a sharp point, uh, water is going to, to pile up there. <coughs> so
So when we have submerged an object in water, so now we are looking away from, from, from uh, when we're moving in, in the surface of the water, when we are submerged, we are all the way underwater. In order to move an object there, you usually uh, you have to use a significantly larger force than if you were going to move it on land. So it's not a problem lifting it because uh, you have the, the buoyant uh, force that's going to uh, work uh, to your advantage so that the weight is going to be less of, of, of the object. But uh, in order to accelerate it, you're going to have to use more force. And that is because you are getting this hydrodynamic mass because water in front of and even behind of the object has, has to be accelerated. So if we have a uh, if we think we have a, a flat plate that we're going to lift, we're going to lift it uh, upwards or if we're lowering it downwards or whatever we're doing, we're ba we basically have a pillow of water on each side of the plate that needs to be moved along with the plate. And then depending on the size of your plate, the size of the, the pillow, and the, uh, the uh, considering the density of water, you can have quite a lot of weight with water that you need to move along with, with the plate. And as we looked at in, in the very first slide, mass is the resistance to being moved. So the mass of the water in these two cushions along with the mass of the plate, that's going to be, be uh, quite a lot of uh, resistance uh, against being moved, basically being accelerated. So, yeah. I'll, I'll try to show you with uh, with uh, sort of vectors for. Uh, I can't I can't be pulling this one up when I'm doing it. Uh, so I'll show all of the water mass moving downwards instead uh, with vectors. So, so the water mass is going to be moving moving towards it like this. But then when it gets to the top here, it's going to start moving along it instead. So that sort of gets uh, diverted to the sides of the plate. So that's where the m uh, that's how we get the, the cushion on top once we're, when we're pulling it upwards. But then uh, the water doesn't just move in here automatically. So the water uses some time to move so that the water just follows basically the same curve as it did up top in order to get in behind which means that the original water that was below the plate, when you started moving it, it stays there because it's not being sucked away by, by uh, the, uh, the rest of the moving water. So the rest of the moving water is just moving around it. So that's why you get this on both sides of, uh, uh, of the plate. So it's a, a bit difficult to get your head around it wh when, when you start looking at it. But, but uh, once you sort of get the, the picture with how the water is moving, then uh, it gets a bit easier to, to understand what's happening. <coughs> so if I had had this equipment, I would have done, uh, done, the, uh, done the experiment here. Uh, so I actually pulled this off of a blog uh, where they, they uh, have this weight, a lump weight, uh, and they have a spring. So they do this in air first. So they, they set the spring to moving. So they look at it. And now we're going to put it in now they put it in water and they start moving it. And you can see that it stops moving quite a lot faster than what it does in air. And that is because of these cushions of water above and below the, the lump weight that's going, uh, going to add extra mass to it, which means that every time the, the, uh, the spring is trying to, uh, to pull itself back, it needs to use a lot more force in this case than what it needs to use in that case which means that it is using up, uh, it is basically using more of the, uh, the stored energy inside the material. Because, because that's why uh, the spring is, uh, when it's being extended, it's storing uh, energy. And then when it pulls back, it's releasing the energy. And it has to release a lot more energy when it has to also pull the water. So that's why it's stopping a lot faster in water than what it does in, uh, in air. So in one way, this is good because we know that 
one thing that can be a huge problem when you're lifting stuff with cranes uh, in air is the, uh, that you end up getting pendulum motions. So your load, and if it's quite a lot of load, you really don't want it to be, be swinging back and forth like a pendulum. Uh, that's something you, you absolutely don't want. But that's less of a problem once you have it submerged, basically just because of this, this effect, so, so that the water is, uh, is stopping it more. So uh, it's a... Uh, it, it brings a lot of challenges lifting things in water, but it also brings uh, a couple of positive sides uh, compared to lifting in air. Another way of looking at this is to have a, uh, a piece of, uh, um, what's it called? Um, it's not foam, uh, but it's this, um, this white stuff, which all of your electronics usually is packed in, uh, the, uh, which looks like snow when you break it up can't remember what the English word is for it. <laughs> uh, but, but if you have a small plate of this, place it on water, and then you have a larger plate also, then you take uh, basically a knitting needle or something like that, and you try to strike hard on, on the small one. What's going to happen with the small one is that it has a very small cushion of water beneath it, so that when you strike hard in it, there is not really much resistance to moving. So you're just going to push the entire uh, plate into the water, and then it's going to uh, come up again because it's more buoyant. Uh, than, uh, than it, ha it has more buoyant force than it has weight. <coughs> but with the larger plate, here you have a much larger uh, cushion of water which needs to be moved. So when you strike hard at the top here, you're going to just punch a hole through the plate instead because you can't manage to move all of that water together with the plate. And we're actually going to see, uh, they, they're, they're, they're speaking Japanese, so uh, you, you'll have to read the text on this one. Styrene foam was the word, yeah. <laughs> え、その真ん中あたりを割り箸で叩いてみます。なんで この絵に全く穴は開きません。では大きな板で実験してみましょう。板を水に浮かべます。割り箸を真ん中あたりに当てて強く叩いてみます。このように板の真ん中に穴が開きました。で、なぜ大きな板で穴が開いたかというと、この板に割り箸を当てて叩くときに、周りの水も一緒に加速させる、つまり周りの水も動かさないといけないんです。そのためにより大きな力を必要としています。これは発泡スチロールの板が見かけ上質量が大
a specific acceleration, we know this from, uh, from uh, regular physics, is F equals MA. So in this uh, compendium, they have uh, chosen to give it a subscript of zero, so F zero, because they also use uh, this one, uh, F one, which is the force that is needed to give the same object the same acceleration when it is submerged. And as you can see here, the the uh, m is no longer a, a lowercase m. So it's not a lowercase m for mass. This is a capital M. And this is because it's the, the total mass that needs to be moved, both the object and the surrounding water. The total dynamic mass, as it's called then. So the additional force that is needed is often called the, the added force, so Fa. And we can figure it out by calculating F1 minus F0. So we get the total dynamic mass minus the mass of the object. That is going to give us the mass of just the water that we need to move. <coughs> yeah, so that is the hydrodynamic mass, also added mass. You saw in the, in the clip they called it added mass. Usually in uh, regular uh, speech, if you're talking to, to engineers from deep ocean or reach subsea or these guys that do, do a lot of uh, offshore uh, stuff, uh, they talk about added mass because it's just easier to say than hydrodynamic mass every time you're going to say it. Uh, so they use added mass or just dynamic mass. So, so it's uh, one of those, one of those they, uh, that's most often used. But, but the correct term uh, in physics is hydrodynamic mass. But we need to keep in mind that even though we have water surrounding the object, unless we're actually moving the object, that added mass will amount to zero b because it's not being accelerated. It's only when we are accelerating the mass that we are going to feel, uh, feel the weight of it on, on what we're doing. So that's the only time that it's going to resist us. If we're just holding it steady, then uh, we're not going to, to, uh, to feel the, the hydrodynamic mass at all. So then we're only feeling the mass of the object. It doesn't mean that it's not there, but it has no effect. So it's, it's still there, but, but it has no effect, basically. <coughs> and we need to remember that because, like with this plate here, if the plate is fairly large in this case, it, the plate itself doesn't necessarily need to weigh all that much. But all of the water around there, it's going to weigh, re it's going to be really heavy. So you can have an added mass that is very much larger than the mass of the object itself. So for, for the, the blowout preventer that we talked about earlier, uh, 250 tons, the added mass isn't going to be more than that. That's uh, pretty sure. But a thin steel plate that is fairly large in surface area is going to generate a huge cushion on each side with water, and that's going to uh, weigh quite a lot, and it's easily weighing more than uh, what, the, what the plate itself does. And one way of sort of figuring out how much water we are going to have to move is to, to simplify the situation. So for an already simple structure like this plate, we can look at uh, more or less uh, consider it as taking off the shape of half a cylinder or half a sphere on each side, so that if, if this plate is um, if this plate here is fairly long, so it's a rectangular plate, and we are looking at it in this direction, then this would be half a cylinder. So we would see the end of the cylinder here, and then we would have the cylinder stretching along the length of the plate. And the same for the underside. So uh, in, in total, you would have a complete cylinder of water around it. <coughs> uh, if it was a circular plate, you would have uh, half a sphere on each side, so that you would have a complete sphere of water uh, in, in total. So one way of, uh, uh, of doing it, then here you have really simple, simple examples. But if we, we go uh, for uh, one example that is uh, much more common in the offshore industry, so if you are lowering a pipe down, so the pipe is already a cylinder, but if you are lowering it down, so you have basically have a cylinder like this, and you're lowering 
lowering it in the horizontal position. So we're going to put, place it down on the ocean floor like this. It means that you will have the, uh, the cylinder that is your pipe itself, and you will also have, let me do this in uh, the red one instead, you will also have half a cylinder up top, that's just water, and you'll look at half a cylinder below, that's also just water, that you have to add to it. And in this case, the pipe would be, uh, would most likely be, uh, be um, hollow, so that's a proper pipe. And then you would also have to take into account the water inside the pipe, because that's also going to add its weight. <coughs> and that, that would be added to the, the added mass. So, so it would be the water of the half cylinder on top, the half cylinder below, and then the water inside also. So, so you would get quite a lot of uh, added mass here. No, it's just um, <coughs> uh, the shape of uh, the pipe itself doesn't really have an effect, but what, what we are looking at basically is the horizontal cross-section in this case. And the horizontal cross-section of a pipe like that looks like this plate. So when we are simplifying it, we are basically just looking at the plate and transferring it to the pipe. And that is uh, one way of uh, being able to calculate it, because then you have, you actually have a volume of water that you can calculate. So that's going to tell you. And in most cases, it's going to give you more water than, than actually is, because since we have, uh, since we have the, uh, if you look at it from this side, we're not, uh, of course, not going to have the half cylinder up top like this and below like this because we are going to have water moving I into this area because of the shape of the pipe itself but you also get uh, you also do get some volume down here with water so it's more correct sort of doing a, an, an oblong like that so that you will get more of an if you look at the total you will get more of an ellipse of water around um, around the uh, around the pipe, but that then you're starting to uh, have uh, difficulties predicting exactly how is this ellipse going to look like and uh, how much volume is that going to give me. So it's uh, to simplify the situation, you do this, and usually you end up with higher added mass uh, when you're calculating it than what you are actually going to to measure if if you had put it. If you had put in a um, a force uh, force measuring tool up here uh, on on your wire, so that you could see exactly how much force it took to, to lift and uh, lower it, then you would would see that uh, uh, when you did the calculations, subtracted the mass of the object itself, you would probably see that your added mass is actually lower than what you've calculated. But still, that is what we want when we are doing calculations. We want to be on the safe side, so we want to. We want to look at uh, stuff in a, in a negative way, basically, so, so that we're going to make it harder for ourselves to accomplish it, in theory, than what it is going to be uh, in, uh, in practicality. So, so that if we're saying that we have an added mass here of um, 150 kilograms, in this case, uh, we've calculated 150 kilograms, and then they actually do the measurements, and they figure it out, oh, it was only 120, so it wasn't that, ba uh, that bad. And that, that's all fair, but, but still, uh, you've, you've done all of the pre-calculations with regards to 150 kilograms extra of uh, uh, mass in this case. And that's why you have dimensioned your lifting wires and everything to be able to handle those 150. The fact that you only have 120, that's just positive. It means that you have uh, more to go on uh, without breaking your, uh, your lifting wires and everything. So, so you using these simplified methods to, to calculate it is, is actually better for our safety uh, when we're doing it. That being said, when you are starting start to get into very complex structures, you, you really do need to, to start thinking about using uh, advanced computer software to do it. Uh, so that we're, we're basically, uh, that kind of computer software basically does the same as 
uh, the finite element uh, methods that you're going to look at uh, next semester with Runal uh, in Mechanical Design 2. We're going to look at basically the computer program dividing up this uh, the material in the pipe and it's going to be dividing it up to many millions of parts and it's going to do the basic statics and strength of materials uh, calculations on every single part and then it's going to transfer uh, the results results that it gets from the first part uh, in the anchoring point here, and it's going to transfer those results to the, the surrounding parts. It's going to calculate those, and then it's going to transfer that, uh, those results to the surrounding parts, calculate those, and it's moving off until it gets to the other end. And then you can actually see how much bend you're going, how much uh, sag there will be in the, uh, in the pipe and everything. And you can do the same for, for hydrodynamic mass, because then what it does is, it doesn't look at the pipe at all. It just excludes the pipe completely. And then it only looks at the water particles that's moving. So then it will basically calculate each, uh, the velocity and direction of every single water particle that's moving past the pipe. And then it will actually see that quite a lot of them are going to stop and have no, no velocity at all on, on top of the pipe and below the pipe. And it can give you the volume of that area and then, and then you can calculate uh, the exact exact stuff. So if you have a very complex structure, that's, th that's the way to go uh, to try to get it. But still, uh, those programs aren't, th they're not uh, magical either. Uh, you, you still have to sit down and input all of your values and you have to try to, uh, to um, you have to really understand how the program works in order to get, uh, get something that you can use in, in, uh, in everyday life. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's a very complex way of doing it. So for now, we're just looking at simplified ways. Yes? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th th there is going to be added mass uh, then also. Uh, but uh, seeing as uh, the, the, uh, the water itself it doesn't affect uh, the buoyancy of the, so, so the added mass won't affect the buoyancy because uh, basically if I just uh, jump back a bit here, uh, so we see uh, this one. So the, the buoyant force, it is dependent on the volume of water displaced and the density of the water. So that's what's going to give you the buoyant force on, on the pipe, how much uh, force upwards when you're lowering it down. So how much uh, force is going to counteract the, the weight uh, of the pipe. But seeing as these half cylinders on top and uh, on the bottom, they have the exact same volume as the volume they're displacing, basically, and they have the exact same, same uh, density because it's still water. It's water displacing water in this case, so they're not going to have any effect on, on the weight. So if you're just lowering it down, the added mass will still be there, but, but you won't really feel it in that way. The way you will feel it is that it will be a resistance to movement, to start moving, so that when you're, when you're lowering it down, you might accidentally uh, speed up your, uh, your winch on, on the crane too much, so that you're lowering it too fast, and then you get a slack on, the, on your wire. And then you can get, when, when it then gets to, to the bottom and it, and start and gets this jerk motion, you, you can still get quite a lot of force out of that. But so long as you are uh, making sure that your wire is tensioned all the way, then lowering, uh, you won't really feel, uh, feel those effects very much. But one thing is, w if you're doing this huge plate where you have uh, not that much weight in the plate itself and you have much, much more uh, added mass uh, to look at, then you can actually get to the point where the resistance to start acceleration to it, uh, it it's going to completely go past almost the, the lowest speed setting on your winch. So even though you're just barely touching the, the forward uh, lever on your winch to, to start lowering it down, this one could be stay still for a little while before it starts sinking. So, so that you, you, you basically get a slack almost no matter what you, you try. So, so that's one of the reasons why we, we have to take it into account when we're lowering also, but it's, it's not going to add too much uh, problem to our force. It's more a point of not getting a slack in our lifting wire when we're doing that. 
and that's more up to uh, up to uh, the operator of the crane to, to have a feel for this. But in order for the operator of the crane to have a feel for it, he also needs to be prepared. So he needs to be told that uh, this one is going to to behave in a certain way because of the shape of the structure. So you need to be aware that uh, you have to be extra cautious in order not to get any get any slack in the lifting wire. So so yeah, it, it, it's going to have some effect, but but not in the same way as when you're lifting. Pass that one also. That was a bit too far. Yeah, it was the simple structures that we were looking at. Yeah. So it's basically the same. If we have a cylindrical structure and we are accelerating it to one of uh, these sides, we are going to get this hydrodynamic mass. So basically the same as I, I drew here. <coughs> and here we have the plate on the next one. And you can see that. If we are lifting or lowering it, we are going to get quite a lot of hydrodynamic mass. But if we are just moving the crane sideways in order to get it into position, then we're not getting really all that much uh, hydrodynamic mass because then we just get the the uh, do it in blue here. We just get these cushions on the sides here instead. So we're not getting the the stuff on top because on top the water is moving this way uh, along the plates, so it's going to uh, it's going to exchange all of this water. It's not going to lock it into place. <coughs> so objects that are not symmetrical, basically the plate like this, it's not going to have the same hydrodynamic mass up and down as it has to the sides because of what we looked at now with the, with the uh, shape of the cushions being uh, quite different. But this also means that we have to take into consideration when we're calculating, we actually have to look at several directions. So we can't just look at sideways motion uh, for the plate because that's going to give us an unrealistic uh, added mass because we have the total, uh, we have a much higher added mass when we're looking at up and down. A fair thing to do <coughs> in this case is that you would assume that mostly it's just going to be lifted straight up and straight down. And that's going to have quite a, much, uh, quite a lot more uh, added mass than moving it sideways. So the little bit of fine positioning that's being done right before it's placed uh, into its final position on, on the ocean floor, uh, it's probably not going to have much effect with this small added mass on the sides. So in the whole, in this exact situation, you basically just need to look at, uh, at the, uh, the largest added mass in it. But for a larger structure, and especially if you're looking at, for an example, a survey ROV that's going to move as quick as it can uh, above a pipeline uh, for as long as it can to, to, and to, to get uh, as much length of the pipeline uh, scanned in as short a time as possible, then you really need to look at uh, both the lowering, because when you're lowering it down and uh, lifting it up, you're going to get these uh, large uh, hydrodynamic masses, but also when the, the ROV is going to uh, propel itself forwards, it's going to get this hydrodynamic mass in front and behind. And then you have to sort of think about, uh, well, the thrusters of the ROV, are they, are they strong enough to, to actually move this added mass as well as the mass of the, of the uh, ROV itself? So, so it comes into play there uh, quite a lot uh, with the sideways forces. And one way that we often do this when we're calculating is to use uh, a coefficient. So the coefficient has no dimension because uh, density multiplied with volume, that leaves us with kilograms. And if we do the added mass and we divide it by that, then we have no, no uh, dimension at all, no unit for it. And the coefficient can be used, uh, can be, uh, be applied directly then so that we have uh, um, you, you can, I instead of calculating the added force, uh, added mass, and putting it into this FA, which is the added force that we need, and then calculating the total force, we can just use the coefficient to, to, uh, to basically just add it to our force. <coughs> and a coefficient like this 
it's only dependent on, on the shape of the object itself. So, so the size doesn't really matter. So, so if, if it's a pipe, it doesn't really matter if it's a 12-inch diameter or an 8-inch diameter or a 40-inch diameter. And it doesn't matter if it's 6 meters long or 12 meters long. It's still a pipe. So the, co uh, the coefficient is going to still be the same uh, for that pipe. Um, yeah, we're, we're going over for a uh, look at drag a bit. So we're going to look at how they do it with regards to cars and trucks. The greater the front surface and the more edges a body has, the greater its air resistance. A drop shape, as found in birds, for example, is ideal. The greater the speed, the greater the air resistance. Doubling the speed results in so a fourfold really increase in air resistance. Added mass of air Thus, behind at a speed of 85 kilometers per hour. 40% of the overall resistance is already generated through air resistance alone. Rounded edges at the front, wind deflector plates on the sides, and a roof spoiler significantly reduce the turbulence and therefore the air resistance. The aerodynamic potential that can be achieved without taking into consideration legal framework conditions is demonstrated by an example of the MAN Concept S future development. So you see they've been drastically minimized. The key features are the, the pillow behind adaptation the of the tractor machine and semi-trailer as a single unit to the aerodynamically ideal shape, reduction of the back pressure on the front of the vehicle, extensive side and underbody paneling, protruding components are minimized. For example, a mirror is replaced by a camera. Through optimization of the cab shape, it has been possible to reduce the air resistance for the TGX by around 4% compared with the previous TGA model. The better the design and adjustment of the spoiler systems, the lower the increase in drag in this area. In the further process, the side contour of the semi-trailer and the cab front in particular offer potential for reductions. So you can see here, it, it's a laminar flow over here, but then you get in into the sides here. Open bodies such as really tipper troughs, platform so bodies with angular of, cargo, or fissured special stuff. bodies, for example, those in car transporters, cause a high air resistance. Depending on the driven speed, this can result in increased consumption of up to 15%. The same principle as they basically used for, for uh, those uh, semi-trucks, uh, the same principle you can use for, for a ship or for an ROV because you get, get the exact same drag, only it's a lot more efficient uh, or uh, it's a lot more negative effect uh, uh, with drag in water because of the, the uh, high density of water. So, so it's going to act much more upon our object than it does uh, with, with a car. So for an example, in um, uh, in my uh, bachelor thesis, we uh, we did these uh, uh, computer simulations on uh, on an ROV in order to to see how how it uh, uh, what what kind of uh, uh, coefficients we would get from it. <coughs> uh, and uh, one of the uh, first calculations we did, where we had the three D model of the ROV, we put it into uh, to our system, and we started uh, running the uh, the uh, fluid particles inside the uh, the program. And then suddenly we got out, well, that, wa that was a really low uh, low drag coefficient on this one. So we got like 0 0.06 or something uh, in a drag coefficient, so 6% uh, in a drag coefficient. 
that was that was really low. Uh, uh, well, that was much better than we we had uh, thought. But then suddenly we realized that we were using the density of air and not the density of water. We had forgotten to change the density of our fluid. So as soon as we changed that one, we were up to 0 0.8, so 80 percent instead of 6 percent. So it's uh, uh, it has uh, quite a lot to say uh, when you are uh, looking at the correct uh, correct uh, medium uh, that you're moving through. So for cars, of, of course, the, the main uh, the main goal with doing uh, analysis like that is in order to reduce fuel consumption. And if you reduce fuel consumption, you also reduce the amount of exhaust that you're putting into, into the environment. And that's positive for everyone. Everyone wants to have, have a vehicle that, uh, that's uh, polluting as little as possible. Because in this day and age, mostly everybody wants to be green uh, and, and uh, take care of the environment. So it's going to be... Uh, it's it's a massive push uh, in the car industry to try to uh, try to do this. But the thing is, uh, the good thing about that is, uh, is that all of the technology that they develop, you can transfer to uh, to the uh, 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 naval uh, part, the, the maritime business. So all of the uh, the good stuff that they do with uh, calculations on air resistance and everything, you can transfer it to water resistance when you're when you're doing uh, uh, this kind of stuff. And that's why also you have these, um, a fairly new kind of ship that's been uh, developed. Let's see if I have a, where's the eraser? Uh, which is called the, I'm not sure if it's called the X-bow or the cross-bow or uh, whatever it's called, but uh, the, uh, the, um, the front of the ship is quite dissimilar from, from other ships because you have this, you have the bridge up top and then you basically have this shape that goes into the water. And they, they, they figured out that this gave them less, less water uh, resistance when moving through the water, so less drag uh, when moving through the water. Because, because a, a, uh, a standardized vessel looks more like it looks more like this when it's moving. So it has this tip pair that's supposed to deflect the water in a, in a certain kind of way and reduce the drag. But what they figured out with this uh, Expo uh, design was that by doing it this way, they, they reduced it even more. So it was a more efficient way of doing it. And I think that one was around 2010, 2011 that they, uh, that they created this design. So it was right before I started in my own studies, which was in 2011. So uh, it was really new back then. And I've already seen at least six or seven different ships uh, moving through uh, through the, uh, the Kamsund uh, with, with this style on them. So, so they've built quite a lot of these ships uh, in the later years. And, and this is a patented design and everything, so it's just one company that builds them. Uh, so uh, no one else gets to build these yet. Uh, but But even though... Uh, it's patented and only one company can build them. They've, they've built quite a lot of them already and, and sold them for to, to different companies. So it's uh, something that's going to to uh, take off, I think, uh, with regards to different looking designs uh, on stuff in order to to reduce drag and everything. And the title is Hydrodynamic Dampening, which basically means the same as the... Mm, drag, so, so you are dampening the, uh, the motion, you are, you are uh, um, basically slowing everything down uh, with it. <coughs> so it's flow resistance or drag, as we've already talked about, and it's completely parallel to airflow resistance on both cars and airplanes and everything. And it's caused by a pressure buildup in front of the object. So you saw all of these lines uh, that were shown in, in the uh, animation. Uh, the, where the lines were red, there was a high pressure. And where the lines were blue, there was low pressure. So where the where, where I added mass cushion builds up, there is a very low pressure. So it's sort of locked in with a low pressure there. And then you have a high pressure of water moving past it because you get a high velocity. And when you increase the velocity, uh, you, get, uh, you get this... Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you get the Bernoulli principle, basically, so, uh, so, so that you get uh, everything there. But I see uh, we're at uh, 10 o'clock already, and we need to switch rooms, so we'll just stop here for now, and then we'll continue on after the break. <laughs>